Hi, everybody. Chick Hearn coming to you from the fabulous forum with exciting NBA basketball. Tonight, the Lakers involved in one of their very best games of the year. Stop grousing, pay up. Put my hair, you know my popcorn, I figure out a way to get my money back. going to get a conviction on these mugging cases, but since you made a positive identification and we got the radio back from the pawn shop, did you make the arrest? Yeah. You know, Mr. Mason, when we picked him up, he wouldn't even tell us his real name. Claimed some friend had given him the radio. Of course, he couldn't remember his friend's name either. Well, I'll drop by your office tomorrow and sign a complaint. Thanks. Uh, Mr. Mason? Yes. I'm Aaron Hayden. I'm program director of the Amateur Athletes Foundation. Now, Mr. Hayden, this is Jules Barron, our founder and president. Mr. Mason. Mr. Barron. I've been waiting for you. Why? Because, Mr. Mason, you're the one person who can help us save a young man's future. Randy is an athlete of rare abilities who's had a, a rough time. Please, don't prefer charges. I've already told the police I'll sign a complaint. And when I did that, I knew where Randy Marlowe started and where he ended up. Mr. Mason, I was supposed to interview Randy this morning. Mr. Hayden here recommended him for a job on our staff. I'm shocked and I'm concerned about what he's done, but we're not ready to turn our backs on him. If you'll refuse to sign that complaint, we'll forget about what's happened. We'll give him the job. We'll help him to help himself. I'll give it some thought. No, you won't, Mr. Mason. You'll just walk out of here and put it out of your mind. Please, at least just talk to him. You'll see what we see. A Randy Marlowe is worth a second chance. Marlowe the Marble, the cagey cagey. Is that what they call you, the sports writers? A magician with a basketball. Look, man, you wanted to see me, so you've seen me. You got your radio back, and I'm in here. We're even. What else you want from me, huh? No, oh, I just want to know why, that's all. Why the star of a national championship team with a million dollar bonus contract ends up stealing radios in parking lots. Well, okay. It's your life. But as a thief, you make a great basketball player. I was, you know. I was. Good, I mean. And as long as you're winning, you're fat. A free ride. Pretty foxes. You want a car, a little extra bread, you name it. Because nothing's too much for a winner, you dig? I dig. And then comes the big payday. A million dollar contract, 
TV and radio and papers and all that jazz, man, you're cool. Until you slip in a preseason exhibition game. And three operations later, they tell you your knee won't work. You've played your last game. What about that million dollar contract they must have settled? Nothing. They've been talking about the small terms in that contract for two years. Nothing. Yes, so what are you telling me? When the sweet life was over and you couldn't make it your way, you decided you'd just steal it? Well, you go on and make your cracks, man, but I'm not jiving. Last night was the first time in my life I ever stole anything. What pushed you last night? I was supposed to go see this guy about a job this morning. Working in athletics, the kind of thing I can do. I had to go looking like a bum. Went out to the forum where I could have been playing last night. I figured I might see somebody who would stake me. Couldn't even get inside. Don't ask me what was on my mind, man. I don't know. I don't know why I took your radio. You thought it looked like a suit of clothes? I'm in the slam. I keep telling myself, Randy, you're an idiot. You're in jail, man. I mean, I still don't believe it. Harry, I just don't understand you. I mean, if you were some kind of a, a, a reformer who, who thinks that every criminal has a lousy mother or some Joe citizen who's afraid to get involved, uh, I can shrug it off. I'm used to that. But you, you know better. Or at least I thought you did. Hamilton, if you stop ranting long enough to listen. Perry, do you realize how many parking lot muggings and murders we've had in the past six months? Yes. Do you know how many of them are second and third offenses? Do you realize how difficult it is to find eyewitness identification and evidence to convict them? I mean, here we come up with a case, a chance to make an example, and you refuse to sign a complaint. Are you finished? No, I'm not finished. Perry, you have an obligation as an officer of the court to press charges. And well, that's it? You're all through? Because if you're not, I'm only willing to be your audience until we get to my car. All right. Now, as an officer of the court, I do have an obligation. Somewhere beneath the tons of rhetoric pouring on me, you have the same obligation to consider every case on its own merit. Terry, I don't need a lecture in justice. Well, neither do I. If I listen to yours, you can damn well listen to mine. Now, in my considered judgment, mine, not Randy's, not his friends, in my judgment, Randy Marlowe needed a break, a second chance. I gave it to him. That's it. A chance to do what? Kill the next guy he slugged? Hamilton, he's got a good job waiting for him with people who seem genuinely interested in him. Oh, really? Who? The syndicate? <laughs> the Amateur Athletes Foundation. I spoke to their top people. Oh, brother. Well, now, what does that mean? Huh. Well, that means that the people that you talk to are all under investigation by the California Attorney General's office. And when they're through with their investigation, some of those people from the AAF are going to be indicted. Because 95 cents on every dollar they take in for charity goes into someone's private pocket. Oh, Perry, you pluck Marla right out of the frying pan and drop them into the fire. Terrific, we're on television. Who is, and for what? Well, mostly you, but I'm supposed to be in the background. Now, I thought if we could shoot it after lunch, I'd have time to go home and get into something a little more exotic. Gertie, did you volunteer the use of this office? Oh, no, you did. You probably oh, forgot. Right. This woman came and told Della that you were a supporter or something, and that it would only take a few minutes, and you'd agree. Gertie, I'm going into my office. When I come out in five minutes, I expect to see nothing out here but you, sitting calm, efficient, and lovely at your desk. Mr. Mason, so glad you're here. I'm Sheila Osborne from AAF. You won't need a teleprompter, will you, for these few lines? And please feel perfectly free to paraphrase anything that doesn't seem quite natural to you. Della? I tried to call you, but I missed you at court. We agreed that you wouldn't set up any of this equipment until Mr. Mason okayed it. Just trying to speed things up. Mr. Mason, let me explain. The Randy Marlowe booster board, you know, prominent civic figures, star athletes, entertainers, shaking hands with Randy, signing up as boosters for AAF. No, thank you, Miss Osborne. You mean to say you're not going to support us? I mean to say I won't be pushed into supporting anyone. Now, please, clear all this equipment out of my office. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Mason? Yes? We, uh, I'm sorry about this. Uh, I didn't know anything about it. Look, can I talk to you for just a minute? It's rather important. Come on in. Miss Osborne. 
You weren't quite fair. Oh, my dear, I just exaggerated a little. Does he belong to anyone? Would you please have the equipment removed? Is he always like that? Only on weekdays. On Saturdays and Sundays, he's really fierce. <laughs> All right, guys, that's a wrap. Randy, I hope you understand. Oh, sure, I understand, but I didn't have anything to do with that. But that's not why I came to see you. The Foundation certainly didn't waste any time putting you to work. Hey, they've been wonderful. Mr. Barron and Mr. Heaton. I checked in this morning and uh, Mr. Barron bought me these threads. They gave me an office and write off a signed contract, even a title. You're looking at the new director of the Booster Boy campaign. I'm impressed. <laughs> look, uh, I thought maybe you might look at something. My bonus contract, you mentioned in the slam that uh, maybe I shouldn't have gotten uh, uh, a settlement. Now, professional teams usually make provisions for cases like yours. That may take some time. I'll have to read this contract, make some inquiries. Look, uh, you've done plenty for me already. Uh, so if it doesn't work, uh, I'll pay you uh, so much a week, say $10, as long as it takes. If it does work, or you just name your fee. Yeah, well, don't spend it yet. <laughs> well, on a remote chance that it does work, I want a big chunk of it to go to the AAF. I I'd like to give them something back. You know what I mean? I'll look into it. Thanks. Hey, what's going on, Gertie? I was going to be in the movies. I'm facing all the fan magazines, big money for endorsing beauty creams, but the boss said... Well, you just stick with it, Gertie. Talent will out. I live in hope. <laughs> I'm sorry. They just came barging in and overwhelmed us. I can believe that. Yeah, you hear the AF really put the arm on you. You know, if the rest of that outfit is like Sheila Osborne. Well, let me tell you something. If they are, you can send a couple dozen over to my house. Sheila. Was she the fast-talking brunette? Yeah, with the terrific... Uh, I don't think she's so terrific. <laughs> Maybe that's because you don't look at uh, things the same way I do. <laughs> I've got work to do. Paul, I'd like to know what goes on inside the Amateur Athletes Foundation. How they raise their annual take, how much of it goes for real services. What their president does to earn the annual salary he pays himself. Okay, how badly do you want to find out? How far would $100 go? Well, that might... Give you a phone number or two. No, I'm sorry, friend. Inflation. All right, mercenary. 500. Well, congratulations. You're now on the Drake budget plan. The AAF is already in trouble. You've been a real shot in the arm for this tired organization. Why, in just the past few weeks, just since you've been here, we've had a whole flood of new money rolling in. From where? From your friends, Randy, from, from your university. I'm hoping that the celebrities I'm lining up for the Booster Boy campaign uh, will really serve as a new source of contributions. Fine. I want you to keep one thing in mind, though. Randy, do you know what the single most important ingredient is to the success of an organization like this? Hmm? Money? No. Loyalty, Randy. Loyalty to the organization. That's in short supply around here. Don't be like the others, Randy. I brought them in here. I gave them responsibility. And now they're all working behind my back. I mean, Sheila, Erwin Beatty. Even Aaron. Now, I hope that as time goes on, and as you move up in the organization, I can count on you. Whatever it is, you can always count on me. It's going to be much longer? I'm sorry, Mr. Edmondson. Mr. Beatty is still busy. What about Mr. Barron? Somebody just came out of his office. I'm going to stay until he sees me, you know. Doctor, Mr. Barron is a busy man. Say, listen, you, uh, you trying to sell him, too? No. I haven't got anything to sell to anyone. Not anymore. Mr. Edmondson? Mr. Beatty! Good to see you. If I'm sorry to have kept you waiting, no, no, won't you no. come into the office? Thank you. Thank you. I, I know you good. have things to show me. 
Would you mind trying just once more? I've got to see Mr. Barron. You'll just have to be patient. I'm sorry. Now, this, uh, this isn't the whole line, you see. Uh, so if you have anything in mind, you just give me a drawing or a picture. I can even make it up special for you. Any amount you want. Well, Mr. Hayes, my assistant, was very impressed with your attitude. He said that you were a man of discretion. From this sample list, you certainly are competitive. But are you sure that you could deliver in quantity? Uh, say, a million and a half of these souvenir dolls for mailing to donors? I bet you'd be only one of our suppliers. Uh, if, of course, I should decide to give you the order. Well, no. What would I have to do to uh, convince you? What do you suggest? Well, you know, it's, uh... It's like I was saying to your assistant, Mr. Beatty. Uh, you know, I gotta like to make a little contribution. Uh, I wouldn't want to pass to any company, you understand? So, uh... It'd have to be in cash. You know, something that you could handle. Mm-hmm. In, uh, round figures. Well, uh, to simplify things, uh, you could deliver the contribution to my home address. Erwin? Erwin, you've got to do something. I'm trapped in my own office. What are you talking about? Talking about Doc. He's out there again. Now, I don't care what you do. Hire somebody if you have to, but get him the hell out of here. Excuse me. Uh, uh, this is Mr. Edmondson. He was showing me some very interesting samples. Mr. Edmondson, could you excuse us for a minute, a little private matter? Sure, that... sure, sure thing. Let me, just, let me just get this out of your way here. Erwin, now, I know exactly what you're up to, Oliver. You, Sheila, Aaron. And you better know this. I can nail you any time I want. Now, Mr. Meadows, Randy said your team had refused to... No, I'm not doubting you, Mr. Meadows. No, Randy didn't tell me he'd signed a release. Yes, yes, I'll get back to you. Well? Randy Marlowe asked me to work out a settlement with Arthur Meadows, the man who signed him to his pro contract. I just talked to Meadows. He claims he paid Randy a hundred thousand dollars. Well, here's the report on the Amateur Athletes Foundation. Now, it took me two weeks and I had to have two men working on it, so I'm afraid your five hundred dollar bill is, um... Inflated? Mm. Everything's in there, but, uh, cutting it down to basics, the place stinks. The state attorney general's office has undercover people all over it. I keep seeing Randy on those TV spots with the boosters he's recruited for the AAF. He's a born promoter. You know, born to be promoted. I think I'd better have a talk with Randy. I don't believe you, Mr. Meadows. Yes, I said Mr. Mason's my lawyer. I don't know anything about any release. Who made the settlement in my name? You gave it to him. Well, who gave him the right? Yes, I'm on my way right now. Hey, Ra Ra Randy, will you? Ra oh. Yellow. Yeah, look, can I, can I quote it? All right, all right, I'll listen, but make it quick, huh? I've been here three days in a row. Could I help it if Mr. Barron was out of town? But he's back now. And his desk is piled up to here. Oh, look, today's impossible. Now, if you want to come back tomorrow... Yes, sir. Nita, take a note to Aaron Hayden for my signature. Tell him he's fired. Sheila, how could he know all these things? Even who said what? It's weird. It's not so weird if one of us was a fink. Well, anyway, Aaron's head is on the chopping block. So who's next? You? Or me? Well, it better not be me. Mr. 
Mr. Barron's office. Hello, Mr. Edmondson. Can you hold? I'll have to catch Mr. Beatty. He just went down the hall. Yeah, hold on. You con me, use me, let me bust my tail in that loyalty jazz. Hey, you're not, you're not making any sense. Now, come on, get out of here and, you know, get some control of yourself, huh? Be, be a good boy. I'm not your boy, and I know now all about that contract you had me sign. A stack of papers, ten signatures. I didn't know I was signing a release and all that. Nobody held a gun to your head. Now, that was a condition of the employment. It's all perfectly legal. So that's how you managed to get your hands on $100,000 of my bread. Come on, grow up, will you, Sonny? How much do you think ex-jocks are worth on the market? Maybe, uh, what, a quarter a dozen? In hiring you, getting you sprung from jail? It wasn't business, that was charity. Now, out. Lieutenant, I'd like hold to it, talk hold to you. Hold it, hold it, hold it. Lieutenant, will you knock it off? I'm thinking. Officer Waite, um, you see, you momentarily interrupted the functioning of this uh, sensitive instrument. Hmm? What do you want to tell me? I want to know if there's anything I can do to help. Yeah, talk to people, find out what, if anything anybody ever saw or heard. Uh, sure, I can do that. And get their names and addresses. Right, Lieutenant. And then I'll give them to you and you can feed them into that sensitive instrument. Use me, let me bust my tail in that loyalty jazz. As soon as they told me that you would be representing Randy Marlowe, I knew that you would be interested in this, Perry. No, I don't watch much television, but this show really grabbed me. You were investigating the AAF. You bugged Barron's office, you know that's illegal. The tape's inadmissible. Wrong. Barron bugged his own office. You know, as public figures have been known to do. <laughs> Only Baron used a little more imagination. He used the same kind of miniature camera that banks use, or jewelers, even supermarkets. So we have here what must be a first. You better sit down, Perry. This is perfectly admissible evidence. A videotape recording of a murder. That's my tail and that loyalty jazz. No, you're not making any sense. Now, come on, get out of here and, you know, get some control of yourself. Be a good boy. I'm not your boy, and I know now all about that contract you had me sign. 
A stack of papers, ten signatures. You know, uh, nobody held a gun to your head. Now, that was a condition of the employment. It's all perfectly legal. So that's how you managed to get your hands on $100,000 of my bread. Come on, grow up, will you, Sonny? How much do you think ex-jocks are worth on the market? Maybe, uh, what, a quarter a dozen? Hiring you, getting you sprung from jail? It wasn't business, that was charity. Now, out. It's uh, too bad that the camera was knocked out of line, but uh, listen carefully. That's Karen going out the window. I want to copy that tape. Sure, I clobbered him. I really hit him. He deserved it as much as anybody ever did. And then you shoved him out the window. No, I swear. He might have been a little groggy, maybe, still shook up, but he was alive and lying on the floor when I left that office. Randy, do you realize if you're lying, the district attorney will tear your story to pieces? And when I jive you, you're my friend. A friend can wish you innocent. A lawyer's got to prove it. You got to believe me, man. I got to believe you. All that tape. Oh, man, you, you, you think I've had it, don't you? Eight, nine, ten, and that's it. And I thought I had it all together. Working with Aaron and talking to all the stars. Really doing some good. I told myself, Randy, you might not be Marlowe the Marvel anymore, but you're still some good. So you run upstairs to Jules Barron's office and take a punch at him. Because I got a call from Mr. Meadows, the owner of the team that signed me. Barron had gone to him and put the squeeze on him for a $100,000 settlement. A $100,000, man. And all the money went in Barron's pocket. Randy, you must have signed a power of attorney or the equivalent where you joined AAF. Ah, who knows, man? I, I signed something. Uh, whoever reads that small print except for lawyers. And all the time I was on TV ripping off all those other suckers when I was the real sucker. All right, when you came out of the office, did you hear a crash? Oh, no. The glass in the window breaking. Well, I don't know. Uh, you, yeah, I heard something in the, ha in the hallway when I was waiting for the elevator. Was there anyone else in the hall? Someone who would have heard the crash when you did and might remember you. Well, I don't know. There was a guy making a phone call or something uh, with, a, with a beard. A little funny-looking joker. Look, uh, what do you call it? Uh, like a triangle. You know what I mean. Uh, Van Dyke. Yeah, with glasses, too. Hey, Marks. Set. Okay, kids, great. Come on, get her up. Now, that was our last practice before Saturday, and you made it a good one. Now, who's going to win that meet on Saturday? We are! Right? Right! I tell you what, let's take two easy laps around the marks, huh? Let's go. Nice and easy, though. Now, well, Mr. Mason, in case you were wondering, that's what it's all about. That's what we're all about. Well, there's nothing wrong with that. But how far does it go? Well, not far enough, that's for sure. I'm surprised you stayed on. Well, the board of directors asked Sheila to take over, and she asked me to stick around for a little while. You know, you give me this program nationwide, give me a lot of support, hook all these kids on sports, we'll have a whole nother generation growing up. Well, that's the public face of AAF. But don't you think it's a little cheap to put out just a nickel's worth of service for every dollar you take in? Now, what do you think all my fights with Barron were about? Why do you think he finally fired me? They were like a bunch of pigs feeding at the trough. Jules Barron stuffing his pockets and soling it away. Sheila conniving and scheming behind his back to steal a whole ball of wax. And Irwin Beatty scooping up everything that was left. And then there was Randy. Yeah, poor kid. Well, from what you've said, you couldn't have been too surprised that Randy finally blew at Barron when he realized he was being used. Who didn't Barron use? The only surprise is that Randy was the first one to blow up. Hiring you, getting you sprung from jail. It wasn't business, that was charity. Now, out. Doesn't look very good, does it? 
Not compared to Randy's chances. Custer was the odds on favorite against the Indians. That well, was the man in the phone booth. With the Van Dyke and the glasses, if he saw Randy come out of the office, and if he heard the crash. That would give Randy the alibi he needs. Yeah, Van Dyke? Well, there's a funny little character sitting next to me in Barron's reception office. The receptionist called him Doctor. Well, maybe she can help you locate this doctor. Well, I'll see what I can do. Paul, run the tape through again. Just the very last part. class of professional athletes, spoiled prima donnas who think that we ordinary mortals owe them a free ride through life. Now, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, Randy Marlowe, the defendant, took everything that society had to offer, education, celebrity, adulation, and the people will prove that when he couldn't get them, he struck out in anger and frustration and he killed. Mr. Mason, you wish to make your opening statement at this time? Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, I did not object to the district attorney's opening remarks, simply because I was certain that you were cringing, as I was, at the blatant attempt to appeal to prejudice prejudice against a young man just because he happened to be born physically gifted. Now, if the defense wished to appeal to your prejudice, we could mention how a 12-year-old boy was kept late at night on a school playground so that hustlers could make bets on his shooting. How a high school coach played that same boy with a 104-degree temperature in a championship game so the coach could win a college job of the university that gave him an easy education and parlayed his superb skill into a very profitable national championship. And of the professional team exploiting their bonus baby in too many exhibition games until an injury cut short his professional career. But we will not use these facts to appeal to your prejudices. Now, we will appeal instead to your judgment. We ask you to consider this case solely on the evidence. If you do that, I am sure that you will find the defendant innocent. What, a quarter a dozen? And hiring you, getting you sprung from jail? It wasn't business, that was charity. Now, out. Now, Lieutenant Tragg, is this the tape that you found in the office of the deceased? Yes, sir, it is. 
Where was the camera located? The equipment was completely concealed so that it could not be seen by anyone. And we could find no member of the staff who had any knowledge that their conversations with Mr. Barron were recorded or photographed. Hey, listen, are you all right? Yeah. Boy, that was my last chance. Janko? No. Okay, let me, let's see. Anybody working for AAF is required to, required to develop proficiency in some sport or other. <laughs> oh. Anyway, I, I've gone right down the list. I've tried uh, tennis, golf, oh. Easy. Bowling, swimming. I broke my ankle trying to ski. <laughs> and today I find a female will issue maker. I'm not. Come on. Boy, I'm not sure what a Charlie horse is. I think I've got one. Well, listen, it's probably just a cramp. Let me rub it for you. Sorry, just relax. Thank you. <laughs> Better? Say, listen, you were, you were telling me about an argument the other day in Baron's office. Yes, yeah, Sheila and Erwin Beatty getting chewed out by the boss and Baron firing Aaron Hayden. And in the middle of it all, a guy called who said he was you. Oh, I mean, he said he was Mr. Edmondson. Well, what do you want? Oh, don't stop. It feels good. <laughs> okay. Um, a price list from Irwin Beatty. I went to look, and when I got back to my desk, everything had happened. The guy had hung up. I wonder who else would know that name, Edmondson, well enough to use it. I mean, that knew that you'd recognize it. Yeah, that's funny. Who's that strange little character in the office one day? Dr. Um, Dr. Doctor. Faraday. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't he ever tell you where he was from? Um, some college, I guess. Jackson State? Where's that, uh, Florida? Mississippi? Michigan? Michigan, I think. Neither. Jackson State at Michigan. Well, that ain't no college. Mr. Hayden, can you explain why you brought the defendant into the organization despite his reputation for... I'll rephrase that. Where was Randy Marlowe? When did the seat and decided at your urging to hire him? Your Honor, may we approach the bench? All right. Your Honor, the answer the district attorney is after is prejudicial to my client. If the witness is allowed to answer, I'll have to move for a mistrial. I'll withdraw the question, Your Honor. Tell me, Mr. Hayden, what did your protege do when he learned that he had signed away his rights to the agreement of his bonus contract? But he got pretty upset. I. He went up to see Mr. Barron. Uh, did you try to stop him, calm him? Yeah. Well, what happened? He just kept going. He knocked you aside, didn't he? Objection. Withdraw the question, Your Honor. Your witness. Mr. Hayden, is it not a fact that you were fired by the decedent from the job you'd held for 12 years? Yeah. Why were you fired? When Randy first came aboard, I, I was so impressed with his, his energy, his enthusiasm, that I began to reevaluate things that I'd begun to accept, that we'd all begun to accept. And I, I guess I argued too strongly with Mr. Barron about the fact that 95 cents out of every dollar was skimmed off the top before just a nickel trickled down to us for actual services. Fired. After 12 years' service. That's a good part of a man's life work. Wiped out, finished. What did you do? I tried to call him. When? Well, right after Randy left the office. With what result? Well, I couldn't reach him. His phone was tied up the whole time. Doctor. Doctor? I'm not a doctor. I just work here. Come on. We both know you're Dr. Faraday. How do you know my name? You're a hard man to find. You're that salesman from Los Angeles, Edmondson. That's right. What are you doing here in Detroit? Looking for you. Why? Because I'm really a private investigator, Paul Drake. So, uh, what do you want with me? 
Well, we think that maybe it was you who called the AAF office, using the name Edmondson to get the receptionist away from the desk long enough for somebody to sneak into Jules Barron's office and kill him. I can't say I'm sorry about that. First useful thing I've done in years. Well, you can understand how important your testimony would be in our client's defense. No, sir. I can't get involved with other people's problems anymore. I've had enough of my own to last a lifetime. Doctor, you know we can force you to testify, so why don't you come along voluntarily? Well, you could help to save a young man's life. Miss Osborne, were you present earlier when Mr. Irvin Beatty testified that you had contacted ten members of the AAF Board of Directors in an attempt to oust Jules Barron? Yes. I was concerned about the organization. I helped to build it. And Jules Barron and his greed were ruining it. It's as simple as that. Was that the subject of the argument you had in Barron's office a few minutes before he was murdered? Yes. But Irwin and I left together. Ms. Osborne, where were you in that brief period after you left Jules Barron's office and before he fell out that window? In the ladies' room. But even if I weren't, there was no way I could get into Barron's office. Erwin Beatty had a private connecting door, but I didn't. And the reception room entrance was under guard by his secretary. Ms. Osborne. That's all I have for now, Your Honor. No redirect, Your Honor. Your Honor, the defense calls Miss Nita Moore. After I received the phone call, I had to leave my desk for a little while. And what happened when you returned to your desk? Miss Osborne, I think it was, or was it Mr. Beatty, told me that Mr. Barron had fallen. And they said to call the police. And then I remembered the phone call, but the party had already hung up. Do you know who it was made the call? Well, he said he was Mr. Edmondson. But later on, I remembered the voice, a Dr. Faraday. And he'd been in, oh, I don't know how many times wanting to see Mr. Barron. But Mr. Barron always said to get rid of him, to put him off. Miss Osborne, would you know this man if you saw him again? I do see him. He's right over there. I guess I was one of the first to be taken by Jules Barron. Only that wasn't his name then. He was calling himself Jerry Barton in those days. How did you meet? There was an article on me in the Free Press in Detroit about a typical country doctor and about a dream I had, a modern clinic in a small town to serve the whole county. Barron saw the article. And he contacted you? Yes, and he persuaded me that he could make my dream come true. I must say, he worked awfully hard. All across the state, dinners, telethons, football games, county fairs. And the money came rolling in for the country doctor's dream. A pipe dream. When it was over, the money was gone. For expenses, of course. Baron was clear. I went to jail. I lost my license. I lost my wife, everything. So after seven years, you found Jules Barron, had your chance to talk to him. I didn't want to talk to him. I wanted to kill him. Dr. Faraday, was that why you came to Barron's office the day of the murder? Made that phone call? Yes, that's right. I'd been trying to see him for weeks. I couldn't get by the receptionist. So I had to think of something to get her away from her desk. And you finally succeeded? I did make the phone call. I did see the receptionist leave her office. But before I could go in, he beat me to it. I'm sorry to say that that young man got in there before I could. What is he doing? Beats me. He's using the witness to convict his own client. So what did you do when you weren't successful in getting into Kill Baron? I waited on the phone. I was hoping that he'd leave the office and I could go in before the receptionist came back. How long did you wait? Four or five minutes. And then I heard a crash, you know, the glass breaking. He came running out of the office. He ran past me. And uh, people were yelling, screaming. I hung up the phone and I left. Dr. Faraday, your testimony raises a problem. So many people running in and out of that office in just a matter of minutes. 
Fortunately, we have an infallible means of clarifying the point. Mason, you please explain what you're doing? Your Honor, we're conducting a demonstration pertinent to the defense in this case. In just a few seconds. Faraday, do you hear that signal? Yes. Were you aware that the phone company has an automatic signal when one party to a call hangs up and the other does not? No, I don't understand. Well, let me explain. We are hearing the beep signal on the call I just made. We heard that same signal on the tape introduced in evidence. But you testified you held the phone for four or five minutes. Yes, I did. It's impossible. The phone signal actuates exactly 60 seconds after one party hangs up. And what does all that mean? It means you lied about the call. It means you hung up the phone almost immediately after the receptionist left her desk. It means that when Randy Marlowe left that office, you went in, found Baron lying on the floor. Doctor, it means you shoved him out the window to his death. You went too late, were you? You had your revenge. Bailiff will hold the witness. Court will be in recess for 30 minutes. Counsel, we will meet in chambers.